Name another show where everyone is 12 out of 10 annoyed, but still watches every season. Notre Dame, or as we Midwesterners like to say, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. When she comes, when she comes. Nice. <laughs> oh my god. Have you heard of this? Of course. It's a common drink that helps shed kilos. What? It's perfect for America. Okay, here's a confession. I watched Emily in Paris. And? Not just the first, the second, but also the third season. Was it a mistake? We'll find out. Also, I think it is important for you to know, having two full-time jobs, one in tech and one being a lawn and short form creator, I rarely watch any shows, like rarely. An average of 0.5 to 1.5 shows a year, and somehow, Emily in Paris snuck itself to that list. Pardon? And literally every friend I talked to who watched Emily in Paris are equally confused as to how they're so annoyed with the show, yet dedicated over 300 minutes to the new season. Bizarre. Hence, I want to make this video. Because no matter how bad the ratings get each year, people still get so invested into the show that does not make sense in character writing, in fashion, in the cultural representation, in everything so let's discuss how the show makes being uncultured quirky you guys just kiss so much here <laughs> why emily is a problem that's weird hidden body dysmorphic hints are you okay the fashion <laughs> as well as the final question why does everyone still watch emily in paris Mwah, Emily in Paris is a show where Emily, an American girl in marketing, goes to Paris to help with a French subsidiary of the company she works at. Season 3 begins with Emily living a double life working for her old American boss, Madeline, and French boss, Sylvie. Okay, go, 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 go! Emily is in a relationship with Elfie while her French love, Gabrielle, is dating her quote-unquote French best friend, Camille. Period. Hey, what's going on? Along with the other drama, the season ends with Camille abandoning her engagement with Gabrielle. But I can't marry you. Because she thought he and Emily are meant for each other, and Emily's boyfriend, Elfie, leaves her to find the right man. I'll go get you, man. Anything for the plot. <clears throat> I mean, true love. If you think the plot was the only thing that did not make sense, behold. Because throughout the seasons, Emily in Paris has done a splendid job in making everything quirky, including culture and respect. Troisième fois, en une semaine, monsieur. Right. I'm speaking French, right? I think so. C'est pas la peine d'assister, il est en panne. No, broken. No shit. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No idea. <laughs> Somehow the show was supposedly a love letter to French culture. I'm not going back to Chicago. But in reality, is a weird mix between fetishizing the French culture and being anti-French culture. This is bad. Before we even touch on not just hints, but straight out flashing neon signs of racism. But the people, so mean. Let's first look at the ultimate pack of French cliché. Cheating, croissant, couture, it gets better. While Emily in Paris indeed romanticizes Paris in so many ways, the show consistently throughout all seasons portrayed French in a way that made a lot of French people angry. Nope. <laughs> they disagree with everything I say. That's the French way. They're very disagreeable. In the show, they are often rude. I think we're done here. Lazy in contrast to our cute little workaholic America Emily. A perfect drink to sip and do nothing as the Ferris wheel turns. I'll see you on Monday. Don't be early. And always cheats. What's the point of being married if you're just going to cheat on your spouse? Uh, Maybe after you're married for 20 years, you might feel differently. I mean, the French are romantics, but they're also realists. An NBC News article quoted a French young woman, quote, it was worse than cliche. It felt like it was Americans mocking French people. Not sure if the show was purposely trying to mock the French, but two things I know for sure. Paris, from a personal experience, was beyond lovely, and I did not find Parisians rude. And the second thing is that this show is outright Patriotic. It is a show to glorify American culture. You think outside the box, and it makes me think I should too. Wait, what? I made the list? By juxtaposing the American culture against the French, the French were seen as outdated, while the American as the innovative, futuristic. Americans invented it. 
which is why I hope to become a valuable member of your team. The French were seen as cold and aloof, while the American is seen as warm and bubbly. The French needed Emily in Paris as their savior because the American hero always saves the day. You, you came to great Paris and, and, and brought up the sunshine for all of us. I'm just doing my job. And speaking of diversity or lack thereof, the show received criticism from season one by having the whole cast and basically all the background actors as white, not reflecting the true diverse dynamic in Paris. Except for Emily's best friend, Mindy, who she met out of nowhere being Asian, her co-worker Lucien being black and gay. Then comes season two. We have Elfie, played by a British actor of color, and let Mindy make a few more new friends who are Asian. Is this performative diversity? Hard to say, but at least we're making progress. My biggest pet peeve, however, is how the characters of color were written on cliche stereotypes. Chinese people are mean behind your back. I'm going to focus on Mindy because I'm both very happy that there is Asian representation in mainstream TV, but also just a little disappointed in how the character was written. Mindy in Emily in Paris was portrayed as someone who lacks sophistication of a western poised woman. She is loud, hey! Sorry, we're late. tells sex jokes. Remember when he was just a chef here and he made you eat his meat? Mindy? Excuse me? Says racist things. You can't punish people for their thoughts. I'm from China. We've tried. If these jokes came out of Lily Collins' mouth, the whole show would be cancelled. But even though the jokes were written by white dudes, no one could call you racist if their jokes were said through an Asian's mouth, right? Keeping it dirty, you'll be fine. <laughs> but the fact that Mindy Chen, a Chinese character, is played by a Korean actress. Laura, that's I will not can I need to defend. Huh? Though I have nothing against Ashley Park, she is very talented. But the lousy script writing, character portrayal, and the casting decision that implies all Asians are the same is, in my view. Racist. Like they could have literally made her a Korean character. <laughs> or maybe it's just conscious or unconscious ignorance. And speaking of playing out ignorance, one character we cannot ignore is Emily herself. Excuse me, pardon. Uh, well, correct for him, but not correct for me. I suggest you try it. Uh, maybe you suggest you cook it longer. No, I, I'll take yours. No, no, no. Take Come on. Maybe I'll educate the chef. A little bit about customer service. You think you're gonna change the entire French culture by sending back a steak? Emily is one of the worst characters I've encountered. She's disrespectful to friends. What? I'm learning. Disrespectful to her boyfriend. I knew there was something. Disrespectful to the culture. Your language is seriously effed up. Disrespectful to her boss. You don't even bother to learn the language. You treat the city like it's your amusement park. And the worst part is, she was never portrayed as a bad person. But I'm an agreeable person. People like me. That's my strength. Being the protagonist, she is always winning in her own righteously ignorant way. Merci. Uh, vous ressemblez vraiment au chien. Are you taking unsolicited photos for your Instagram? <laughs> I was planning a character analysis in this portion before I realized there is no character arc to really analyze. From season one to season three, although new plots, characters, and questionable costumes get introduced, one thing that stays surprisingly consistent is Emily's character. She lacks the humbleness to learn and pay the minimum respect to the culture she is no longer new to. That's such a lovely name. Wait, would you just mind pointing it out? Okay. Oh, Ted! Got it! <laughs> The respect for boundaries to not sleep with your friend's boyfriend and be in a relationship but be in love with someone else. Oh, bonsoir. All the way to season three, she still conveniently does not speak much French. Trey, better. Tea Louis, Mindy. I mean, it's not worse. She tries to impose her ways onto everyone else around her, and at the end of the day, she gets her way. Everyone else is a problem. I'm not really sure Paris likes me. Every man she encounters becomes so enthralled by her. Every French man speaks perfect English. Every business solution she suggests is always a hit. Here's a cute cat wearing a sun hat. <laughs> no idea why. From a girl actually in marketing or anyone in any profession knows how BS it is the way Emily smooth sailed through her career in all three seasons. It's impossible. She's a bitch. I knew it. She follows me. 
She follows you? Why don't you follow me, Emily? The biggest problem she had was her relationship with her French boss, Sylvie, and of course, choosing between a promising startup firm or a giant American corporation that both want her desperately. I get it, I do. Even with social media, she gains followers by the minute like a joke by posting selfies. Bonjour, it's Emily in Paris. Today is day one of fun employment. I am your eyes and ears to this beautiful city wow oh a lot of you are joining already okay and the most frustrating part is that she wants it all a job at two great firms a french man and a british man keeping the friendship with camille yet wanting to be with her boyfriend idealistic or just greedy but as the show follows emily and solving her quote-unquote problems it's almost like watching a whiny kid complain about all her privileges all day long all her problems are basically caused by herself and that's how the show propels forward and also i might do a separate video on this but i want to take a quick moment to talk about the show's relation with body dysmorphia because i haven't seen much coverage of this topic online the show made jokes about why french women are skinnier than american women because they just smoke cigarettes instead of eating do you want to have lunch no, I'll have a cigarette. And drinking magic leek soup to have a typical lean French body. The magic trick, a little secret. Why didn't you tell me that earlier? Well, that wouldn't be a secret, would it? I just don't think that there's a magic way to lose weight. That just sounds like something Gwyneth would push on Goop. Oh, you can get us on Goop? Oh, let's do that, please. First of all, suggesting smoking instead of eating to get a great French body is like wrapping starvation in a lingerie bag. It's still starvation. And secondly, it's subjecting French women to a specific body type and labeling a certain type of body as body goal, whereas a standard American woman's body is seen as inferior, thereby reinforcing a stereotypical beauty standard. Have you heard of this? Of course. It's a common drink that helps shed kilos. What? That sounds so bad for you. Yes, but it's perfect for America. In season three, there was a scene of Emily and Gabrielle eating at a Michelin restaurant where Emily claims that she is so stuffed. I can't have another bite. Me neither. With a super flat belly showing no signs of a food baby or even eating anything. Everything was fabulous. Again, I get that this is TV and not a serious production meant to save lives but in relation to how popular the show is oh my god you saw that <laughs> and in relation to how so many young girls are watching this and beginning to build the expectation that this is how your body should look after a 12 course meal could get a little problematic especially since actress lily collins struggled with anorexia and bulimia in the past <laughs> I am a basic bitch with a bad charm. I feel like if we were to discuss Emily in Paris, we need to at least touch on the fashion. Since the consulting costume designer Patricia Field is known for the iconic styles of Sex in the City and The Devil Wears Prada. But the fashion in Emily in Paris, specifically for Emily herself, is a lot like her character. Confusing and questionable. For starters, just because it's Paris, does not mean that everyone, including a girl who calls herself basic and cannot afford couture, wears designer. Since season one, Emily has been dressed in a pretty green Chanel coat, Louis Vuitton, and off-white puffer, season two with mini dress from Dolce & Gabbana, plus Christian Louboutin bag, a good Valentino belt. The H&M collab dress though was gorgeous and a great pick. Then season three, green pattern Mimi jacket, Celine, Louis Vuitton, and so on. But the only thing we could afford from any of those designers was a clip-on bag charm from a outlet mall in Winnetka. Point is, styles aside, the accuracy behind the branding of Emily's wardrobe is also confusing. If they want to make her financially well off, then do it. But don't try to paint her as someone relatable who cannot afford couture, yet wears non-repeated outfits and designer. In terms of the style itself, how do you say this nicely? I know the designers are making Emily's style fun, colorful, bold, but it delivered as loud and like a stolen closet from 10 people. We have the mismatch patterns, streetwear elements, random metallic touches, feathers because they are in. There's simply no 
one signature look. The lack of cohesiveness is suggesting an ambiguous identity, which is not reflected in the character writing. Because for better or worse, throughout the show, Emily does not change. She has no character arc and keeps her way because why bother to change? She gets her way regardless. You may mock us, but the truth is you need us. Without basic bitches like me, you wouldn't be fashionable. The jumble mix of random styles are almost reflective of someone chasing random trends and doesn't know what she wants, which is kind of true. It gives off buying off whatever the algorithm serves and hopping onto micro trends that pop up. Although the wardrobe is not made of fast fashion pieces, the fashion attitude is very much fast culture. Because the show, unlike Sex in the City, was probably not trying to make a lasting impact on culture, or more so, it seems like the show was trying to throw in different elements so that at least one will hopefully be trending against time, but not sure about you. Unlike Sex in the City, I personally do not think the storyline, scripting, characters are worth a rewatch, even though I sadly watched every new season so far. So why do we still watch Emily in Paris? That's it. We have to do something. I think you already did enough. Do you mind closing the door? But how can they- It's business, Emily. Without even- Door. <sighs> now, don't feel miserable if you spent over 900 minutes watching every season of Emily in Paris. Feel terrible. Just kidding. In life, we make mistakes. And sometimes more than once, just to be sure. Just kidding. It might not be a complete waste of time. And you certainly are not alone. The new season reached number two on Netflix by collecting 117.6 million hours of views in a week. It's Netflix's top 10, even in France. And even though its ratings are declining as the only conflicts driving the show forward are self-inflicting ones originated from our heroine herself. <laughs> Surprising or not, a New York Post article headlined, quote, Emily in Paris is now too boring to even hate watch. The article wrote, quote, the 10 episodes are so dull you can't even hate watch them, for hate requires passion. Now I do agree to some extent, but this highlights the exact reason why some people watch the show. It requires no emotional investment. I'm so there. <laughs> No, I haven't asked you anything yet. Emily in Paris, for me at least, is the perfect easy form of escapism. It's visually flamboyant but still pretty, it shows a romanticized version of Paris, fashion, events, excitement, music, and not all the characters are irritating. I personally adore Sylvie and Luke. The fast-paced story also doesn't keep you waiting. It's also a very lazy TV show where you don't need to think much or at all. I'll never lose sleep over if she picks a shockingly ugly outfit or has a romantic affair with another guy. Everything is pretty in pink. There is no real grave issue like financial instability, heartbreak that the audiences can actually empathize toward, or anything beyond the next hot French or London men to date. It's also a show written by Americans for Americans. It glorifies American culture, shows how American ways are the new ways, so of course it's a feel-good show for most Americans to watch. In a GQ article called Emily in Paris is for the dudes, Chris, a 40-year-old creative consultant said, television for me is I want to watch something that is sweet like candy. I don't want it to push me in any way. And bingo, that's exactly it. Because the show only comes out once a year, it's like an occasional candy we have. Good for the moment, but no lasting values or nutrition. So as long as it's not the only thing we are consuming, one can enjoy a candy or two. And whether you feel like the candy is solely up to your taste.